Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. For my June 13th garden column, I wrote about what I'm calling garden blunders, and that's where you've made a mistake in the garden and hopefully learned from it. So I polled my Facebook followers the other day, and I said, what kind of mistakes have you made in your garden and what did you learn from it? And they were so forthcoming, it was awesome. And so what I thought I would do to pair with the column is to do a video about different types of garden tips that I have that will hopefully save you from making horrible mistakes. So that's on tap for today. I would have to say one of the most important tips I want to share with you is to know your hardiness zone. I'm in Spokane, Washington. It's about 300 miles east of Seattle and most of Spokane is in zone six, but we managed to buy property in a microclimate where it's zone 5B. And so that affects the types of plants that I will buy for our landscape. Now you can find out your hardiness zone if you don't already know it or you're new to the area by either asking gardening friends and neighbors or talking to your master gardener program. If you don't know how to find them, just do a web search on Master Gardener Program and add in your county after that. So for me, it would be Master Gardener Program, Spokane County, and they will help you out. It is so important to know your hardiness zone so that you buy the right types of plants for your garden and they should thrive for you if you do that. You do not want to engage in what we like to call zonal denial. So let's say, because I'm in zone 5B, I see a plant and I think, oh, that is so cool. And gosh, the tag says it only is hardy down to zone 7. Well, it'll probably do okay in my garden. Well, no, it won't because it won't make it through our nasty winters. So it's very important that you understand your hardiness zone. And what goes right along with that is understanding your frost-free days. And that mainly is applying to planting things like annual flowers or planting vegetables. So that's something that you can also find out from master gardeners. And that means when is the last frost in the spring and when is the first average frost in the fall. All of this is such important information. I've been a master gardener for almost 20 years now. And one of the first things we learn as we go through our training is to always put the right plant in the right place. This is so important and we would all save so much money if we followed that simple advice. So this means taking into account the light requirements a plant needs. So you wouldn't want to put a shade loving plant in full sun because it's going to fry, right? And you certainly wouldn't want to put a sun loving plant in the shade because it is not going to do well. You want to take into account the mature size of a plant. You know, one of the things I see, and this is a pet peeve of mine, is a tree planted right next to a house. And it's something that's going to get really large so you know the homeowners are going to have to deal with it down the road. And it is such a waste of money and time. So really look at the plant tags so that you understand what a plant needs before you buy it and before you pick a spot to plant it. So let's take a quick look at a plant tag so I can underscore what I'm talking about. Here's a tag for a lovely bush clematis I just bought a few days ago. First of all, you'll notice that it says full sun to part shade. So that explains the range of light that it will tolerate and do well in. Also that it is a perennial, meaning that it will come back year after year. And then when I flip it over, you'll notice it says the height is 24 to 26 inches, and then it should be spaced 24 to 26 inches. This is very important. Here we are with the light, and this tag is especially nice because it says more than four hours of daily sun. It's hardy in zones three to seven. I'm in zone 5B, so that will be ideal. It even tells me when it's going to bloom, late spring to midsummer, and that can help you if you really are a great planner for what you're putting in different beds in your garden. So always take a look at the plant tags and be realistic 
about whether a plant will do well or not in your garden. Do not plant aspens in your landscape. This is coming from personal experience and also what I've seen in many new developments where a landscaper has come in and I don't know if aspens are just cheap or what, but they'll put a bunch in and what happens is the homeowner has to deal with tons of shoots coming up in their lawn, in their neighbor's lawn. You will never be able to get rid of them all. So this is not a good tree to plant. And here is exactly what I'm talking about. Here's shoots, here's shoots, here's shoots, here, 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 going across the yard. So annoying. Always research plants before putting them in your garden, whether you are buying them or a kind friend or neighbor is giving some to you. About 30 years ago, a dear friend of mine gave me some of this buttercup. We had just started landscaping our five acres and she said, now this one will spread quite a bit. And I thought, well, that's okay because we've got five acres and I need to fill in the property. Well, that was a mistake because it has gone everywhere throughout this long perennial bed. And let me show you one other offender. This is a type of hardy geranium. And even though the flowers are beautiful, it has also spread just about everywhere. I try to keep up with it, but it is a nice filler plant, so I don't mind too much. But this was also given to me by a kind friend and I remember at the time she said, you know, it spreads pretty well. <laughs> if somebody says that to you, run in the opposite direction. <laughs> I mentioned my master gardener training and there was something that I learned early on. And that is if you're going to grow fruit trees, you need to take care of them, which includes pest control. I remember at the time thinking, boy, that sounds really harsh telling folks, well, don't bother growing your fruit trees if you're not going to take care of them. But actually, that is good advice. That's because if you just plant your trees and you don't worry about pest problems, you've created a nightmare for all of the neighbors around you who are also trying to grow fruit trees and grow them responsibly. This is our small orchard. We have about 18 fruit trees. And we're growing apples, cherries, Asian pears, plums, and peaches. And we grow everything organically. Now that does not mean leaving things alone. We have organic methods that we use that are research-based, and you can learn more about them by going to my website. If you go to susansinthegarden.com, go to the guides menu, and you'll see a link underneath that says Organic Pest Control Guide. In it, you can learn how we deal with apples and cherries. So apple trees have a, some really nasty pest problems. In our case, we get apple codling moth. In some areas, they deal with apple maggot fly as well. Awful pests. But we do have very sound methods that we use. Now, if you really wanted to grow some fruit trees, but you're thinking, I don't want to go to all that trouble, I heartily recommend growing plum trees, especially Italian plums. They are delicious, and they have minimal pest problems. If you live in an area where deer are a problem, always research which types of plants tend not to be bothered by deer. Now I know this can vary between one landscape and another, but it is worth your time to do that research. When we first bought this property, one of the things we bought was a bunch of arbor vita plants, and that was to make this hedge along the edge of the garden as a bit of a windbreak. And we had no idea that arborvitas are basically a form of candy to deer, and so they really munched on them. Now, fortunately, we now have a seven and a half foot tall deer fence that goes around our little orchard and around our immediate backyard. So that has solved the problem. But these are candy to deer, so do your research. 
Don't underwater or overwater your plants. Each are equally bad. What you want to do is to poke your finger down into the soil to the second knuckle and see what it feels like. It should feel lightly moist, not sopping wet, and not bone dry. Now last year we had a really rainy spring and I had planted our melon seedlings a couple of weeks before the rain started and they kept looking like they were wilting. I thought it was because they didn't have enough water, so silly me, I kept giving them more water, I ended up killing them. So you need to know that wilting leaves doesn't always mean that a plant is too dry. So always check your soil, make sure that there is a bit of moisture in it, and know that as the summer temperatures heat up, you're very likely going to have to increase the amount of time your plants are watered. Now let's conduct a little experiment for another lesson. So I wanted to make a point today about something having to do with watering and it is really important to remember. If your hose has been on for a bit and it's just laying out in the sun, the water in there is so hot and it will burn and kill your poor little plants that you wanted to hand water. So I've got an empty bucket here, nothing up my sleeve. I've got a compost thermometer that will work just fine. And I've got the hose here. I'm going to put some water in the bucket and then we're going to take its temperature just to illustrate the point. Now it isn't a particularly warm day as you can probably tell by what I'm wearing. And I haven't had the hose out all that long, but let's see what temperature it is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to squirt some water from this hose. And let's see what temperature it is. Try to hold this so you can see it going. So we're at 85. This is kind of like watching paint dry. <laughs> We're at 90, heading towards 100. There is no way plants would tolerate that. It would definitely burn their foliage and possibly kill the poor plants. So you don't want to do that to them. Always move your hose to another area where it's not going to hit any plants and run it for like a minute at the most and the hot water should clear out of the hose so that you can safely water your plants. Yeah, I'm at about 98. Whew, that's toasty. Yeah, very hot. Now let's talk about some vegetable gardening do's and don'ts. My first tip is to start small. I know it's easy to get excited when you see all of these different types of seeds and plants at garden centers, but keep it small so that you won't get overwhelmed. If you go crazy planting things, you probably will not be able to keep up with it and then you'll get discouraged and I don't want that to happen. Also, remember I talked earlier about knowing your frost-free days. That is so important when you want to plant warm season crops like tomatoes, peppers, melons, pumpkins, cucumbers, winter squash and summer squash, green beans. All of these things need to be planted after the danger of frost has passed. So don't try to plant them too early because mother nature is cruel <laughs> and she can frost your plants and then they're either going to die or be horribly set back. So don't set yourself up for disappointment. And then lastly, if you start plants from seed indoors, be sure to put them through the hardening off process before you move them out into the vegetable garden. They need to be acclimated to the intensity of the sunlight and the temperatures outdoors. Because when we plant things indoors to get them started, it's very controlled conditions. And so if you just move them right out to the garden without going through the hardening off process, they will become sunburned, which means their leaves will turn white and they will either be set back horribly or they will die. So you want to avoid that. So what is hardening off anyway? That's where you're gradually acclimating them to the sun and to the temperatures. And to do this, what you do 
is you move them outdoors for about an hour, put them in a filtered sunlight type of a situation, and then move them back indoors after an hour. The next day, two hours, and then move them back indoors. The next day, three hours. So you get the idea. And each day you're exposing them to a little bit of a sunnier area. So if you go through this process for about a week, by the end of those seven days, they will definitely be ready to go out into your garden. When using fertilizers and preferably organic fertilizers, make sure that you follow the label directions to the letter. More is not better. And do not repeatedly use high nitrogen fertilizers. That's because they will promote tender green growth that is so attractive to aphids. So don't set yourself up for horrible aphid problems. Now, if you're wondering how to read the label of a fertilizer package, there's always three numbers. The first represents nitrogen, the second is phosphorus, and the third is potassium. In this case, this is bone meal, which is high in phosphorus, and you'll notice this says 3150, so it's mostly high in phosphorus, which is great because it helps with blooming and setting fruit and also good root growth. So read your label directions because it's very important. And last but not least, I wanted to talk about bugs for a moment. Always, always identify a bug before you decide its fate. You know, we have far more beneficial bugs in our gardens than we realize. And you would hate to kill something that gorges on aphids, for example. So make sure you know what you're dealing with before you take any action. And if you decide that you need to use some type of a control product, always choose organic. This is so important. You do not want to use chemical pesticides. And I know I'm getting on my soapbox here, but they are non-selective, which means that, sure, they'll kill the bug you're trying to get rid of, but they'll also kill the beneficial bugs that would have controlled the problem for you. You don't want to do that. We gardeners have the opportunity to make a big difference by being picky about what we choose to use in our gardens. We need to go organic. And then when you do choose a product, make sure you follow the directions to the letter. Again, more is not better. Now, of course, you know I'm the author of the new book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, and it is filled with over 200 photos of bugs at different stages in their life cycle, what the damage looks like that they cause, and all kinds of methods for controlling them that are all organic, research-based, and effective. So it is a great resource for gardeners. I hope you found all of these tips helpful and useful. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. And remember that I am selling signed copies of my new book. Just send me an email, susan at susansinthegarden.com, and we'll make it happen. I'll see you next week.